What's going on folks, Nate here at Tool Dino Works, and as promised, we are going to dive into the complete build process for our 2023 ZX-10 and my personal race bike for this season. Now, those of you who've been following the build series will notice that this looks absolutely nothing like the Phase 2 build video that we posted about three weeks ago. This bike is now completely set up for the track and no longer resembles the street bike that it was in the Phase 2 video whatsoever. To recap, phase one of this thing was essentially doing the full M4 exhaust system, the MWR velocity stacks, a DNA air filter, and then our custom tuning on the dyno to get it right up to about 199 horsepower to the tire. And then phase two was all about the ergonomics. We talked about the Vortex rear sets, we talked about the Woodcraft clip-ons, talked about the zero gravity windscreen, and that is about where you leave these things for a street bike. You now have essentially the bike set up and adjusted for your body type and weight and the preferred riding position you have. And it makes almost 200 horsepower to the tire, which is all you can really ask for and all you honestly ever need on the street. But obviously this is going to be a race bike, so we've turned it into this. Now again, this is a enormous build in terms of all the little parts that we've put into it, so I will do my very best to cover all of them. I'm sure I'll forget one or two of them, so just forgive me, and if you do notice something you want me to mention, go ahead and just say so in the comments, and I will happily talk about it. So sort of step one for prepping this bike for the track was to get rid of the stock bodywork. We now have Armored Body's bodywork on. No, it doesn't come black. It's just primer gray when you get it out of the box. We've painted it and thrown some decals on it because you just do not want or need all the additional weight and the expense, honestly, of the stock plastics. It's a track bike, so if you're racing, it's eventually going to hit the ground. There's no way around it. The armor body's bodywork is less than a thousand bucks shipped, whereas individual panels can cost you a thousand bucks for the stock bodywork real quick. When we pull the stock bodywork off, we are also removing the intake flapper that's up there. There's a whole bunch of lighting modules in this area that we remove. There is an EVAP canister underneath this side that we also pull out, and all sorts of stuff just to save weight, because again, we don't need any of that on a race bike that's never going to see the road ever again. We've also installed GB Racing case cover protectors because, again, it's likely going to hit the ground at some point. I went about 2,000 laps in the last couple seasons without crashing, and that's better than just about anybody can ever ask for. But the inevitability of this thing hitting the ground is 100%. It's just going to happen, so you might as well get some protectors over the case covers so you don't end up smashing through the cases and wasting an engine on a simple low side that really shouldn't have done that much damage to begin with if you have the proper equipment installed. So that sort of covers the bodywork and the crash protection for the track. Now let's talk about the brakes, because this was a non-ABS bike to begin with, but the stock master cylinder and the stock brake lines just weren't going to do the trick. So we went ahead and replaced the stock master cylinder with a Brembo RCS-19, which is my preferred master cylinder of choice on these bikes, and of course one of the Brembo reservoirs. The stock brake lines were also not steel braided lines out of the factory, they were still rubber lines, so we went ahead and had Gormoto build this custom set of lines that we've got installed now, so the front brake feel is amazing compared to how it was out of the factory. The rear line, however, we did just leave as the stock rubber line. I don't use a whole lot of rear brake on these bikes. We even went ahead and put one of the lightweight, sort of skeletonized rear rotors on here to save about a pound of rotating mass. And we went ahead and deleted the rear reservoir. We just got a tube, like just about every race bike on the planet does, because you just don't need that rear reservoir. And they're kind of a pain to mount with the rear sets on the bike, because they just don't have the stock bracket like the stock rear sets do. So once we got the brakes where we wanted them, the next thing we need to tackle was suspension. And well, we go for gold. So Olin's is the only thing that's ever going to be on this bike besides the sock suspension, and I'll show you what we got. It's kind of a funky angle with the camera, but that is an Olin's TTX GP rear shock with the remote preload adjuster. We actually got this from Barry over at KFG and had him revalve it and adjust all the setting bangs before we went ahead and installed it. And with his chassis data, we also went ahead and adjusted the rear ride height, added some shims to the shock before we installed it, and swapped out the swing arm pivots for some zero degree offsets from the Kawasaki Racing Parts Kit. You can just get those from your Kawasaki dealer, they can pull up the accessories manual. You want the zero degree offsets if you're going to try to find some traction out of the rear of this bike. And the other bit of the stock suspension that we swapped out is the stock steering damper. It is technically a Olin's unit, but I've never been very happy with them. It's the same Olin's unit that's been there since like the Gen 5s, and it is just not that great. I went ahead and just put on the SD001, Olin's mechanical, sort of old school, but still works amazingly well, steering stabilizer. So let's see, that is bodywork, crash protection, brakes, suspension, now we need to shave some weight. Obviously stripping the stock bodywork and all the emissions compliance devices off the bike shaved a ton of weight, but we also removed some rotating mass by replacing that brake rotor back there, which we already touched on, and also getting rid of the stock chain and sprockets. The chain and sprockets that we go with are always either vortex or driven sprockets, depending upon what is currently available, and the RK GXW ring chains 
which just reduce rotating mass by a ton. There's also just no need to run 525 or 530 pitch sprockets and chains anymore. These chains and sprockets that we use are easily going to hold up to 220 horsepower lap after lap after lap. So with a bike that's only making 202 to the tire, there's just no reason to go with anything sturdier. The lightest stuff you can run is the 520, so that's what we went with. We also went ahead and swapped out the stock ZX-10R wheels for some of the Marchesini Forge ZX-10RR wheels. Now, the ZX-10RR Marchesini wheels are not actually lighter than the stock ZX-10R wheels. However, they do still allow the momentum to change a little more rapidly, either accelerating or decelerating, because the moment of inertia of the actual wheels is lower. I'm not going to get too much into the science behind that, but even though the wheels are marginally heavier, the moment of inertia is lower, so they do accelerate and decelerate quicker, and also allow the bike to flick into corners and handle better. Other bits that we should probably mention are obviously this carbon fiber tank cover and extender. This thing gives you massively more real estate to plant yourself against, so under hard braking and cornering, you have a lot more real estate for your legs to grab a hold of, and it also does provide some very small amount of crash protection when this thing inevitably hits the ground. It's got at least something between the ground and the tank. It probably won't provide much protection, but anything's better than nothing because tanks are a thousand bucks. One other thing we should probably mention that you can't see while the bike is assembled is that the stock battery is gone. We went ahead and replaced it with a lightweight lithium battery. It shaved almost five pounds off the bike, which is enormous and essential for a race bike. And then the last bit worth mentioning, which you can barely see down there with the O2 sensor sticking in the pipe, is our data logging system for building our custom fuel mapping on these bikes on the dyno, and that we'll also be leaving on for data logging on the track. Installing data loggers on bikes is pretty standard procedure here for us. We use them a lot when we're building our custom fuel mapping on the dyno, but we also leave them on a lot of bikes, so when we go out to the track, we can get data on things like ram air that you just can't really accommodate or compensate for well in a dyno room. So on this bike, we have the Zetronix kit from Woolwich, which we've used to go ahead and dial in the fuel mapping to just an insanely precise degree on the dyno and we'll go ahead and leave it on for the few percent we have to add or remove based on my best guess for the ram air compensation we're going to have when we're on the track at 180 miles an hour and the end result of our custom tuning on this bike has now resulted in 202 horsepower and 85 foot pounds of torque to the tire on pump gas which is just insane this bike is a fucking rocket ship now so stuff left to do on the bike uh not a whole lot Obviously, we still have the key in place. That's going to come off. I've got a Woodcraft key delete kit on the way from Woodcraft. We're also going to get rid of the stock gas cap because I just hate having to have a key when we go to the racetrack. So we've got one coming from Moto. We've got an Akisoto cap on the way for this guy. We've also got some tech spec tank grip pads on the way from Moto as well because, well, this is slick as hell and doesn't really give you a whole lot of traction until you get those pads installed so you can actually grip the thing at high lean angles on the track. I've also still got to ditch the kickstand. That is going to go away as well. As soon as my last Woodcraft order shows up, I've got a dongle, which I really don't need. I can just jumper the kickstand switch, but it's just a little bit cleaner way to do it. Yank that guy, shave a few more pounds, and then we're probably done with the weight savings on the bike. When you ditch the stock bodywork, you lose your bracket for the regulator rectifier, so I've got to Velcro that better up in place. Um, we've got some wire cleanup to do underneath the bodywork, and I don't really like where I ended up mounting this late at night, so I'm probably going to relocate that. But other than those little things, this bike is essentially done, dialed in, and ready to race. Probably also worth mentioning that the throttle by wire mapping was still just a little bit on the twitchy side for my personal liking. I have again built and ridden the fifth gen several times and we have professional riders of ours that we sponsor and work with that are riding the sixth gens and they said the throttle mapping that we had was great but I actually still thought there was some room for improvement so I went ahead and updated it once again and that will be available to any of our current customers that have six gen ZX10 ECU flashing from us as a free update or any future customers will also get that applied to the sport mode for the throttle by wire mapping in their bike. So that's gonna be everything for today folks. The bike is tuned, dialed in, ready to race.
there's really nothing else we need to do this bike to get out on the racetrack and go have a good time. We'll go ahead and also get some sponsor graphics on there for all of our sponsors and partners, which we'll talk about more later once we get out to the track later this month. If you're here local in the area, Too Fast starting track opening day is April 24th at the Ridge. We will absolutely be there. If you're not going to be, well, you're missing out. And as always, if you have any questions about getting your Kawasaki, your ZX-10, your ZX-6, whatever your bike is, we are more than happy to help get it properly tuned, built, and dialed in for you. Give us a call or shoot us an email, support at tooldynaworks.com.